What's up, everybody? We have the notice of appeal filed by Jim Archibald on behalf of Lori Vallow. I believe there are 16 issues that they have mentioned. This is going to be my first time reading through it with you for our instant reactions to see, do any of these issues actually have merit? Does Lori Vallow have a decent chance of overturning this conviction based on any of these appellate issues, at least just based on the title? We don't get the full thing here yet, but this gives us an idea of what they're going to be arguing, what they have found as problems with the trial, because the appeal is based on what happened at the trial. So hit that like button if you haven't already and subscribe to our page. We will be continuing with this case, even in the post conviction phase, which is where we're at now. And this is our uh, first document we've read since then. The above name respondent, state of Idaho and the party's attorneys, Lindsay Blake, Fremont County prosecuting attorney, um, blah, blah, blah. Notice is hereby given. So he's putting them on notice, all the prosecutors. The above-named appellant, Lori Noreen Vallow, a.k.a. Lori Noreen Daybell, appeals against the above-named respondent to the Idaho Supreme Court from the judgment of conviction entered on August 2nd, 2023, Honorable Stephen W. Boyce presiding. The party has a right to appeal to the Idaho Supreme Court, and the judgments or orders described in paragraph one above are appealable orders under and pursuant to Rule 11C. A preliminary statement of the issues on appeal, which the appellant intends or sorry, then intends to assert in the appeal provided any such list of issues on appeal shall not prevent the appellate from asserting other issues on appeal. So this is just a preliminary list of what they found so far. They can add to it and they can also remove some of these. They might not end up in the appeal. So let's read through them. Here are the issues. First, did the court err in its dated April 11th, 2022 in its order dated April 11th, 2022, wherein the court found that the defendant after spending 10 months in a mental hospital was competent to stand trial. So that first argument will absolutely have merit if they can prove that she was incompetent. We did multiple videos on the burden to prove competency and how insanity is different than competency and competency basically centers around, can she understand the process, understand the charges against her, understand the potential penalties? Is she able to aid in her defense, talk to her lawyers, understand the proceedings going on around her so that she can answer their questions um, and be involved in the process? So- they have medical records we probably haven't seen, so it's hard for us to say whether or not this one is true um, or I should say legitimate. I would say usually when they find that she's not competent for a period of time and then something changes and happens that now she is competent based on more than just what the defense attorneys say, usually not a big one, a big winner on appeal. But if they can't prove it, it's it's a guaranteed win. So it's a really, it depends. Uh, B, the second issue. Did the court err in its order dated November 15, 2022, wherein the court denied the defense expert requests to send the defendant back to the mental hospital rather than proceed to trial? Again, this is kind of reverting back to the competency issues. The defense doctors and arguments they're going to make, I guess, that she was not competent to stand trial, and therefore this trial can't be legitimate if you have somebody that was incompetent. Um, that's a legitimate protection that uh, is protected in every state and by our Constitution. You have to be competent to stand trial. C, was the defendant's constitutional and statutory right to a speedy trial violated by the government's repeated request for a continuance? So this one, as we read through um, their motion to dismiss based on the violation of speedy trial and Judge Boyce kind of admitting it was outside the speedy trial period. And that was one of the reasons he struck the death penalty, but decided to still go to trial. This one could have merits. It must be strictly construed with within this speedy trial period. Now there were competency issues and other delays that were potentially attributable by the defendant. So for a deep dive on this, check out my video on the defendant's motion to dismiss based on violation of speedy trial, which we will link in the video description below. Let me make a note of that. All right, next. Was the defendant's constitutional and statutory right to a speedy trial violated by the court's trial setting? So did the state's continuance violate it or the, the court's setting things out, picking certain dates saying, we're going to schedule the trial on this date, picking a date outside the speedy trial period? This could be a legitimate argument here by Lori Vallow's team. Did the court err in denying defense challenges for cause of trial jurors due to the bias or hardship during jury selection? So 
I don't know the specifics because we didn't watch and listen to the entire jury selection in this case. But what this means is a juror said, yeah, I do have to work. I am going to probably be thinking about work a little bit, but I can probably put it aside and do it. And the defense said, no, judge, that's a hardship. Let them go. They're not going to be focused on the case. And the judge said, no, we need jurors. They said they can do it. Let's put them on the jury. And the defense is worried that they weren't able to focus in on the case and make the right decision. A tough one to win on, but possible. Did the government commit fundamental reversible error in its opening statement? So this is a little bit vague. We did listen to a lot of this opening statement. I didn't see or hear anything. I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything that really perked my interest or piqued my interest um, that it would be fundamental reversible error. But this is something that we have to wait for the full appeal to hear what parts of their opening statement um, they believe actually was reversible error. This, that just means the state said something in their opening that was totally inappropriate, threw off the entire trial. We need to do it all over again because um, it was a reversible error. That would be something like um, bringing in another crime. And maybe they're talking about the Arizona stuff, but bringing another crime or saying she's probably killed other kids or something like that. If, she, if they said something like that, that would probably be a reversible error. That would be a reversible error. Uh, G, did the court err in allowing the government to produce evidence of other crimes or acts against the defendant under Rule 404B, Idaho Rules of Evidence? Now, this we knew was going to be an appellate issue. The Arizona stuff, um, uh, Nate asked about this in his interviews with the jury. They mentioned it. They talked about it. They considered it, but only the way that it was appropriate. Um, but then there was some argument on the motion for new trial that it was clear they did not understand the instructions of the court and how to deal with that 404B, other bad acts evidence uh, with regards to Charles Vallow and what happened in Arizona and all of those facts that came into this case, if the higher court finds, just like we talked about in Murdoch, if the higher court there finds, if it ever gets there, that, that the other bad acts evidence should not have come in or it was inappropriately used or the jury did not understand it or whatever it may be, this could be an appellate issue. But again, almost every case that 404B other bad acts evidence comes in, this is an appellate issue. So just because they're making it doesn't mean they're going to win on this. H. Did the court err in allowing the government to exceed the scope of its order regarding other crimes or acts against the defendant 404B? So again, another argument that uh, they went too far in how they used the other bad acts. And we have evidence of this based on the jury interview is probably what the defense is going to say, that they didn't understand it. They used it for inappropriate purposes and it led to them convicting Lori Vallow. Did the court err in allowing the government to amend the grand jury indictment two years after the indictment was filed without sending the case back to the grand jury? We heard arguments about this on the motion to dismiss and motion for new trial. I don't think this one has a lot of merit, personally. Unfortunately, the state is allowed to do things like that. J, did the court err in allowing the jury to hear statements of co-conspirators, but then rule in jury instructions that the government need not prove those persons were part of the conspiracy? So this to me is an issue that has already been dealt with in other cases. Um, there's going to be precedent on the state side that allows this, even though it may seem unfair sometimes. I don't think this is a very um, strong argument for uh, on the appeal. Okay, when the grand jury indictment puts defendant on notice that she has charged a conspiracy involving five or more people, can the trial court ignore that finding instead and proceed with the standard conspiracy jury instruction? Again, I don't think this is a strong argument. I think that conspiracy, two or more people, um, the standard jury instruction language is fine, whether or not initially it said five or more people. I get the defense's argument that maybe they would have made different arguments if it was just two or more people versus five or more people. Um, so making that change without them being able to prepare for it, maybe it has some legitimacy to it. I can't see them overturning this verdict for that. Did the government commit fundamental reversible error in its closing statement to the jury? Again, same thing with the opening statement. I don't know what they're referencing specifically, but when I listened to it, I didn't hear anything that necessarily jumped out at me. M, did the court err when it granted without hearing the government's objection to the defense request for the court review all mitigation evidence submitted by the defense for sentencing? Okay, that's another one that's just kind of overarching and vague that I don't think is going to create reversible error. N, should a new sentencing hearing be held due to the sentencing court not reviewing all mitigation evidence submitted by the defense? Um, again, the defense wanted to, to provide more mitigating evidence. I really don't think... I mean, even if it is overturned and they go back and do sentencing again and he listens to all the mitigating evidence, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this because regardless of what the mitigating evidence is, we know what the judge was going to sentence her with life and that's what happened. And if we have to go back and redo sentencing and hear the mitigating and aggravating circumstances again, I think we have the same outcome. So again, 
It's just kind of legal thought to discuss this stuff. I don't think practically anything's going to change. Oh, and again, you can tell which one of these dealt with the trial and which one of these dealt with the sentencing because they're appealing both the trial and sentencing. Oh, did the sentencing court abuse its discretion by ordering the defendant to serve three consecutive fixed life sentences without parole? Again, does this matter? Uh, the answer is going to be no, it didn't abuse its discretion because the court's allowed to do that. But even if they win this and it's three concurrent life sentences versus three consecutive life sentences, practically it does not make a difference. She is spending her one life on earth in prison. The rest of it, at least. P, did the sentencing court abuse its discretion when it ordered the defendant who had been found indigent, qualified for a public defender, and had just been ordered to serve life in prison without parole to pay $165,018 in fines and court costs? Again, I doubt this is going to be successful, but if it is, she was never going to pay it back anyway. Number four, there is a portion of the record that is sealed, including all mental health reports of the defendant and the pre-sentence report. And again, that's going to deal with the competency issues and maybe mitigating factors, actually. So it could deal with multiple of the 16 issues listed above. The appellant requests the preparation of the entire reporter's standard transcript as defined in IAR 25D. The appellant also requests the preparation of additional portions of the reporter's transcript to include. So this is them asking for the transcript so they can read through everything and cite it in their appellate brief of the entire trial, but not just the trial. There were some hearings that they want as well. And these hearings are going to revert back to some of the issues we heard on competency issues, motions to dismiss violation of speedy trial. Um, the indictment needs to go back to the grand jury. That's what I expect these hearings to be. So let's hear a, the hearings on defendant's competency to stand trial B the hearings to determine if the defendant should be sent back to the mental hospital. C, all pretrial hearings on motions, including motions to remand the case back to the grand jury. Motions to determine if character evidence was appropriate. Yeah, the 404B stuff. And the scope of that evidence. Motions regarding what the government's discovery violations. Motions regarding the death penalty. All hearings at the jury trial, including voir dire, opening statements, closing statements, all jury instruction conferences, return of verdict, any argument or motions on objections, and any polling of the jury. So those are things that maybe were not in front of the jury, weren't part of the actual trial, but sidebars, things like that. All hearings between the jury trial and sentencing, including motions for a new trial, motions regarding victim impact statements and objections to the pre-sentence report, the sentencing hearing, the appellate, the appellant requests that the standards clerk record pursuant to rule 28 B2 IAR and all exhibit recordings and documents for rule 31 IAR, because again, she isn't paying for it. And this stuff is incredibly expensive. So they're asking for the court to order that she gets a transcript of it again, paid by taxpayer dollars. I certify that a, that a copy of this notice of appeal has been served on the court reporter, that the appellant is exempt from paying an estimated transcript fee because of the appellant is indigent. See that there is no appellate filing fee since this is an appeal in a criminal case. And D that service has been made upon all parties required to be served pursuant to rule 20 IAR. All right. So, in looking back, and that's that's the whole document, but in looking back, I think the most significant issues and Lori Vallow's best arguments are going to center around her competency, number one, her speedy trial rights. That might actually be number one, competency number two. And then there was one other one, the 404B. Did they take the 404B evidence too far? Those are, I think, her three best arguments. Um, again, competency, speedy trial, and other bad acts evidence. Those are the ones that people would most commonly win on um, if those issues arise. Again, even the most commonly won appellate arguments are very, very small percentages because usually you lose appeals um, and you only get to appeal or usually you only appeal a case if you lose. So they're not often successful, but I think those are her three best arguments out of the slew of issues that she has uh, noticed the court and the other side on. So if you guys are still interested in this stuff and want me to cover the appellate process, the post conviction proce process, please let me know in the comments and let me know by liking the video and subscribing to the page. That's all we've got for this one though. So until next time, I'm out of here. What's up everybody? It's Peter Tragos, the lawyer. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at Tragos Law is our handle. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast featuring new episodes every week. 
If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyerunow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, the lawyer you know.